And what's interesting is, you look here, verses 16 through 21, the answer is five verses. Isn't that interesting? Of all the different explanations of how much he could say about the future, it's five verses. And yet, there's a lot here, isn't it? It's a packed five verses. And in fact, these five verses encapsulate everything that Jesus wants us to do from, obviously, from the moment he gave them, all the way, as he says, to the end of the age, when he mentions that he would be with them. But the reason that this is a familiar text is, uh, if not the most familiar, is because this is the foundation of everything that we talk about. We come back to this text over and over again, and in fact, I think that's one of the challenges of doing these kind of lessons is, how many of us already know this text? Everybody knows this text, right? And I'm probably not going to tell you something that you haven't heard before. But what I want to help us to do today is to walk a little bit through this section and then talk more about how do we actually do this. Because you're not going to find necessarily some maybe novel insight, but maybe you can get some encouragement this morning about how to do this. And so let's talk this morning about the mission from heaven to earth. That's what we're going to talk about as we go through this. And if you remember our theme, what's been our theme? It's that prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's the will of God being sent from heaven to earth to be done and to fill the earth. And so let's talk about this mission here to the nations. Let's briefly walk through this chapter, and then we'll walk through how to walk through this, uh, how we do this. And so here in verse 11, he says that he is meeting their, them in Galilee. I'm sorry, in uh, verse 16. There, that he was going to meet them in Galilee. And remember, this is what Jesus promised them. In chapter 26, in all of those events, he said, I will go before you to Galilee. We talked about this last week, and here we have mention of that. And when they, when they get there, they see him, and it says in verse 17 something interesting, and it might be kind of unusual. This isn't something maybe we always think about. But it says that some worshipped and some doubted. Now, does that mean there was more than the 11? Because they'd have multiple encounters with him. I mean, that's one possibility here. But it's also possible, it's not talking necessarily about unbelief as much as uncertainty. One of the things we've talked about with the resurrection so far is it was clear to understand that Jesus was raised, but the significance of what it meant for him to be raised wouldn't have been immediately apparent. And so we have some, some of these questions then. What does it mean now? And what it means is, is that there's a mission. And as you look through this section, he's saying something has fundamentally changed. And we talked about this last week, about how the day the world changed, something has completely changed. And he says there in verse 18 that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. That's what the resurrection meant. And we'll see more about this in the book of Acts and other places. Luke actually ends with this. But remember in Daniel chapter 7 about the Son of Man coming and sitting at the right hand of God and, and re, re, inheriting a kingdom of heaven and earth forever. That's what he's referring to. That has happened now, and he's going to ultimately ascend and receive that position. But what he's describing, though, is the great reconciling of God and humanity. That work has been accomplished now, and a victory has been secured. And as he's talking about through this section, a new age has begun. We talked about that already when we went back in Matthew 24 and 25. But remember, now something has changed. The age of eternal life has begun in Jesus. And then now there's a mission that is passed on to the disciples that they're supposed to go and make disciples. But notice it's not like the earlier commission in chapter 10. This is for all nations. This is for every single person. It's not just the Jews. And so they're going to baptize, which is, again, bringing them into that community, just like John and Jesus had been teaching. And through that teaching, they're going to make fully obedient disciples. But one of the things he mentions there in verse 20, and it's important, he says that he is going to be with them. Now, when we look at the book of Acts then, what is the book of Acts? It is Jesus working through them, through the power of the Spirit and changing people. And he is going to be with them then and do that work till the age of sin and death is removed and the age of eternity begins. Now, this whole section, again, is an earth-shaping, life-altering section of Scripture 
And it is again them going now and accomplishing that prayer of Matthew 6 and verse 10. And so the goal then is to spread the kingdom in the world and to have his will done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's been the goal. If we go back and we look at all the way through this gospel, that has been the goal, hasn't it? And when we look at this ending, we might ask again, why is it just five verses? It's because this has been what Jesus has been talking about the entire time. Just as a means of review a little bit, remember, there's been five different discourses in this gospel. We had chapters 5 through 17, chapter, or chapter 7, chapter 10, chapter 13, chapter 18, and 24 to 25. But who was the audience in all of those? At the beginning of every single one of those, it is Jesus sitting down with his disciples. He is teaching and shaping and molding them. In fact, Matthew is about discipleship, about making them who they're supposed to be. And he's been emphasizing this. Go to Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, when he gave them this training period of going to the Jews, he said something important. And as we talk through that section, yes, there was specifics about the mission that they had to the Jews, but we made these bigger principles about how the, eventually it was going to spread into the world, and then now we're seeing that. But one of the things that he has said consistently through this gospel is things like this. A disciple, verse 24, is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and the slave like his master. And if they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of, their, of his household? What have they seen in Jesus? What have they heard from Jesus? They've seen someone that has constantly gone out and talked to people and educated and strengthened and, and reached people with the gospel. And so now as a disciple, it's more than just saying you believe in him or that you're learning or following. That's kind of what we often think of. If I ask you, what does a disciple mean? That's probably what you would say. But for us, we need to think about what discipleship really was. It's about more like an apprenticeship, that you come into a program not to just say, hey, it's great, this is interesting, it's to actually take it on. Like if you have someone that's an apprentice at a, you know, Tom here is a lawyer. He doesn't come and be an apprentice of Tom just so that he learns more about being a lawyer. It's so that he ultimately becomes a lawyer. That's what this whole goal was of them following Jesus. And so the goal is for them to be fully trained and to be like their master, is what Jesus said in Luke 6 and verse 40. Now go to the book of Acts with me. They're going to take the mission forward. And the book of Acts, we think about it oftentimes as the Acts of the Apostles. But let me encourage you to think about it a little bit differently. It's not about the apostles in that. In fact, if it was about the apostles, why is it just about basically two of them, right? <laughs> it's just Peter and Paul. But if it is about Jesus and what Jesus is doing through the apostles by the Spirit, then we understand a lot more about what this book is about. It's the continuation of the story. And so in Acts, 8, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, look at what he said as he was speaking to them. He says in Acts 1 and verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And then... We have this ascension. It's the continuation of this. And it's important to see what all this means. Again, this is how you break down the book of, the, of Acts, this expansion of the kingdom, but it reaches even to us as well. But as they went out and they turned the world upside down, what is he saying? He's saying, I am with you. I'm going to be, be helping you through the power of the Spirit. And so these people, again, they're bringing the gospel, the good news of Jesus in his kingdom, into the entire world, and that's the rest of our New Testaments. Now, one of the reasons I want us to kind of see that storyline is because a lot of people, though, they look at that story and say, that's the apostles. That's great. They accomplished their mission. We're eventually, you know, reading their words, and we're being shaped by it and all of that idea. But when you look at this text, the goal is not just for them. It is for all disciples. It's about understanding what discipleship is about. What becomes clear is that the apostles pass on the mission to us, 
to every individual that becomes a disciple to all generations till Jesus returns. Now, how do we know that? As you look through the gospel or through the book of Acts, you see so many things are done primarily by the apostles. It's all that way till you come to chapter 6 where the seven are selected. And then you have the sermon by Stephen. You have the teaching by Philip in chapter 8. But notice this in chapter 8 and verse 4. In chapter 8 and verse 4, the people that had been suffering because of the persecution that started there with, with, with Stephen, look at what is said about them. It says, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Now notice what he's saying. <laughs> he didn't say they went around looking for a new place to meet. Okay? That's not what he said. He said these people, they went around sharing the word everywhere they went. And who is he talking about? He's not talking about the apostles anymore. He's talking about normal people just like you and me that had obeyed the gospel. In fact, go a little bit later in Acts chapter 11. There's comments about these same people. Remember, they spread out because of the persecution. Paul is spreading and following and chasing them as well. And the persecution continues, and they continue to be scattered. And look at what he says in verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, continue to look for places to meet, right? That's not what it says. Made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking to word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Who's doing the work? Who's spreading the gospel here? It's people like Philip and Stephen. And as you look through the rest of the book of Acts, it's people like Barnabas, Silas, Aquila, Priscilla, Timothy, Titus. Notice those are not the apostles. It's people like you and me. The mission continued on. And so in short, what is the significance of the Great Commission? In short, the rest of the Bible and the rest of the time is the rest of the story. And it is about us. It is about our story in taking up the Great Commission and continuing that story. I think it's interesting that he writes five words, but yet the whole point is go in and fill the rest of the pages. Write the rest of the story as you go out and you share the gospel. Now the question then is how do we accomplish this? How do we accomplish the mission? Now that we've gotten kind of this overarching picture of what's happening here in this section, go back now to Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look through four different things that he lines out here that are going to be fundamental for them to accomplish the mission. Because now that we understand the work does mean every single person. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you are involved in this particular work. How do we then do that? And notice he begins and ends with Jesus. So let's start, let's start with the first thing that he says here in verse 18. And it is that we need the authority of Jesus. Notice he says, verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he says, Go therefore. Go because of this. So this is a foundational element. Now one of the things that Matthew has stressed throughout his gospel is actually the fact that Jesus has authority. Now, I think authority just in Western culture right now is just kind of almost a bad thing. It's kind of seen as an oppressive thing, something that's illegitimate maybe, all of those kinds of things. But what he's describing is a, a kind of authority that is good and that is necessary. And in fact, that authority is seen in chapter 7. When he finished the Sermon on the Mount, they responded with the, you know, in, in awe really of the authority that he's had. But further, the authority was in his actions, like how he forgave and he performed miracles. And so there was no one greater than Jesus, and he's sharing that with the apostles. And yet, what is the kind of authority that Jesus has? What was different about his? If you remember that interaction that he had with the disciples on the road to Jerusalem in chapter 21, he says, we're not going to have an authority like the nations that lord it over them, but that greatness in the kingdom is going to be about service. And what we've seen through that gospel, especially there at the end of his life, 
is that's exactly who Jesus is to an infinite degree. And so it's not about just authority in the sense of being able to tell people what to do. It's about that authority that is used for service, for the benefit of other people, to help them. And so it's not like the nations of the world. It is like a servant who gave his life for other people. Now, why is that so important then? Because that is the means then for us to be able to do any of this. We have to come back to Jesus and his word. Because when you go out and you talk to people, are you giving them good advice? You're not giving them good advice. You're not saying, hey, this is how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> it's, it's not a suggestion manual. You're not saying, hey, you know, my life has been better. You should make a few changes in your life. That's not what the gospel is. It is the message of a king that has conquered sin, death, all enemies, earthly and heavenly, and every knee is going to bow before him. And so we, when we understand that concept and understand his authority, there's a lot of things that kind of flow out of that. First off, am I submitting to that authority? And as I go out and teach people, and, and am I understanding who he is, that this is a king that is giving instructions to me? And then as you go through and you look at the way they spoke to people and they went out and told the world, they're not saying, hey, Jesus is the best wise teacher now. Jesus has the best information. Over and over, it's Jesus is king. That's the message. But yet, isn't that what's under attack in the world? There's a reason that people, when they look at Jesus, compared to some of the you know, pop kind of wisdom of the world, they don't react the same way to him. It's because it's about the authority that Jesus has. See, the clash is over right and wrong. And that's the foundation of what we deal with. And truthfully, it's, it comes down to this fundamental question, is whose word is right, who has the authority, and is it man's word or God's word? Who gets to set the rules? That's what it comes down to. And so if we don't have that foundation... I mean, how are we going to try to win people over? How are we, like, what's, what's the foundation of what we're trying to do? It's about Jesus has done something. He's the king, and people have to listen to him. Otherwise, it's just opinions and suggestions. But Matthew has said he's the king of the world. And because of the resurrection, all men are now told to repent. Now, when we look at that fundamental concept, Again, it's important for the world to understand, but it's important for disciples to understand. Because first off, what does that mean about your life? Who do you belong to? Who has the authority in the life of the disciple? I think in you know, just Western culture, we would say, me. I'm the greatest authority. I get to do it my way. And yet, when we look at what the gospel is saying, it is saying you do not get to do it the way that you want to do it. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, is the way that Paul describes it. You do not belong to yourself. You don't get to live the way that you want to live. And further, understanding that then, have you given yourself completely? I mean, when he, you have concepts like 1 Timothy chapter 6, that's a king that comes in and says, this is how you're supposed to operate with your wealth. Why does he operate like that? It's because he owns it. <laughs> you belong to him. And so he can give you directions on how to do this. And so that asks just the fundamental question, if you've given yourself to the Lord, is he the Lord of your life? I think a lot of times we want to be saved. We want to be you know, redeemed and set apart from the, the mistakes we've made, but we don't always want a Lord that comes into our life and tells us it's this way, it's not this way. And yet that's the point here. But let me give you a contrast here. Here's, here's the right attitude. One time I, I was, just this week, I was hearing some people reflecting on the gospel, and these people, they had the right mindset. There's a lot of things I would disagree with, but both of them, in essence, he told two different stories about this man and his wife. And what they said in light of the gospel is this, if you did that for me, then I'll go wherever you want me to go and do whatever you want me to do. Now, when I hear that, <laughs> uh, it's almost like my skin is kind of like, whoa, like my, uh, my initial reaction is to push against that. But the whole point is, if we've understood the message of the gospel of Matthew, 
of who he is, of how he is the true king and how he became the true king through the death, burial, and resurrection, and it's for you and for me, that's the logical reaction. Is say, you're the king. You're better than Caesar. You're better than any president. You're better than any ruler. And I'm giving my life to you. And so we should want to say and to do the same kind of things. That if he says go, we don't say, hold up, Lord, I don't want to do that. We say, yes, Lord, and we're glad to do it. And again, it starts with his authority and how he, and how he obtained that. But let's go farther in this account. He then goes on to say, because of that, understanding his authority, now we need to go and make disciples of all the nations. And I want us to go to a text here in Isaiah for just a minute. In Isaiah chapter 2, remember, this has been what the kingdom has been about. If you went through, I'm actually teaching Isaiah right now with some guys in Guatemala. It's been good to kind of go through a lot of these concepts. But in Isaiah, one of the things he's picturing is the king and the kingdom that he is going to bring. And notice again here in verse 2, the description of what that's going to be like. He says, now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain, that's a, a, a description for the kingdom, mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the nations and will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So he's saying that his kingdom is going to be established over the earth and the nations are going to come into it, and that the law is going to come from Jerusalem. And when we look at the book of Acts, that's what's happened. But the clear test for us is right here. If we're part of those people, are we going to be the ones that are bringing that word out? Are we going to be part of the people that are bringing others to Jesus? So when we think about this kingdom and this picture, we're part of this identity. This is our mission. But yet, how often are we, are we actually going through with this? One man was talking about this, and he illustrated the concept from Matthew 28, and he was talking about it with his daughter, and he, uh, or used the illustration with his daughter, of saying, hey, go clean your room. Pretty simple, go clean your room, right? But he said his daughter understands what he means. She doesn't come back and say, I memorized what you said. She doesn't come back and say, I can say, go clean your room in Greek. <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't say, my friends and I are going to gather together and have a study of what it would look like if I cleaned my room. You see the point? The point is, we've got to actually go and do it, right? He's the king, go and do it. And yet he made the point, though, why do we think this kind of talk would work with Jesus? It doesn't work with us in our houses with our kids. It's not going to work with him either. So what does Jesus mean then? What does he mean about the going? Now that we're kind of working through actually going and doing it, what does he mean by this going into all the world? Well, I think sometimes we can make too much of this concept and too little because it encompasses a couple of ideas, like in the book of Acts. There are some people that are going to various areas and they're going and they're not traveling all over the world, but what are they doing? They're teaching the gospel where they are. You see that in Acts 8, you see that in Acts chapter 11. But then you have other people, like in uh, chapter 13 and kind of throughout the gospel or throughout the book of Acts. I'm getting that all confused this morning. I've been in a gospel for the last like 12 months, so... Um, but they're going through and having trips where they go to various different places. Now, what happens in our minds is we, we listen to great things like with Tim and Bill, and we think, okay, that's great that they're going and do it. It is great. But it is just as great and just as important for you to go and talk to your friends and your neighbor and your family here. They're not one above the other. They're both critical. They're both important. 
And so what you have to do is you have to find out how, to, how can I serve. There's some people that are better disposed to say, hey, I can go over to another place. I have the freedom to do that. And other places are not. But the point is, wherever we go, we're to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of, uh, by the authority of God, and making these disciples. Now, I want us to talk a little bit about this, about what we're doing. Notice verse 19. He says, to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we go out and we're teaching people, what are we trying to get people to do? Is it just to believe? It's not just a general confession of who he is. We're trying to give people to trying to get people who want to become that apprentice, that are devoting themselves to the Lord, that are wanting to change their entire lives. And in fact, he says that they're to baptize them, just like John and Jesus did. Notice again, here's this authority concept. But what was the purpose behind that? Well, Acts mentions it's for repentance and remission of sins. It's for joining the kingdom. It's for adding to the body of Christ. But why baptism? Remember what we talked about last week about how this was a unique symbol that came out of the death, burial, and resurrection, okay? Why is that important? It's because a symbolic picture of, A, what a person has to do. They have to die to themselves. They have to come to life in a new way. But further, it is the message and the lifestyle of the actual disciples. I mean, a lot of times it's easy to just say, well, I've obeyed the gospel in the past. And that's true. But in a sense, we're always obeying the gospel. We're always going through and dying to ourselves so that other people can live. Think about this passage here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul is talking about the gospel, he's not going through and just saying, hey, this is one thing that I did in the past. I died to myself. It is a continual thing. Notice here, let's pick up at this first one in, verse, in chapter 4. He says in verse 10, always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so death works in us, but life in you. That's the point. And he's saying that as disciples, that the reason that you live this type of lifestyle is to bring other people to him. Now, notice in chapter 5 this point now, in verse 14. He says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You see the message? You see the point? It's not just a one-time thing. It's about the entire message of the cross and about how we live. And so, again, all of this is done, as he said, by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, we're bringing people from every place, from every culture, from every group, and we're adding them or the, bringing them to God who adds them to this group, this called-out group of people that are going to live different. Now, go back to Matthew 28. And the question then, I think that once we understand what he's describing is, are we doing this? And are we able to do this? See, when you think about this text then, and what's described here, this isn't something that's for the faint of heart. It's not just an easy thing. It requires someone that is willing to die to themselves so that other people can live. And so when you think about evangelism, it comes down to people that are dedicated and that are willing to sacrifice areas of their own comfort and personal preferences in order to try to reach other people. You know, one of the great suggestions and some of the plans for next year is about having one family from, you know, someone that you know in the community that's maybe not a Christian or, you know, in some other uh, capacity um, that needs the gospel to have them into your house once a month. That's a great suggestion. Now, is that a sacrifice? It's absolutely a sacrifice. 
I mean, if you had anybody in your house, you already know it's a sacrifice. But yet that's something that all of us can do. Or if it comes down to sacrificing a night of the week to go and teach a class or participate in a class, that's a sacrifice. But the thing is, again, that's part of discipleship. But if we understand what discipleship is, that it means that I'm not going to just do what I want. I'm going to sacrifice so that other people can live. It becomes very logical. Instead of saying, well, this is my house and they're invading my space. You know, I heard one lady describe it. She said, this house belongs to the Lord. It's going to be used ultimately for that purpose. See the attitude? It's a very different attitude. So it requires dedication and planning, a different attitude. But second, it also requires us to be equipped. How comfortable are you in teaching the gospel to someone else? I can't answer that question for you. You've got to be able to answer that. But can you do things like reading the gospel of Mark with a friend and being able to explain and answer that? Now, I'll tell you, if you can't do that, one of the things that I've already got this plan for next year, we're going to go through the Gospel of Mark, and this is our fourth Gospel in four years. So we might be like, oh, we're going through the, another Gospel, right? But the plan is uh, Austin and I are going to try to use that time for, to teach people how to teach the Gospel of Mark to people. And so that's, you can kind of look forward to that. But that's something for you to work on, to become comfortable with that and think about, how can you read and help people in those ways? But further, do you know the scriptures? Have you, have you had a plan to where you could go through and say, if you have someone come and say, I, I need to be saved, how, how can I be saved? What would you teach them? Do you have a process? Do you know the scriptures? Those are things that are, they're just steps. But that's part of what it means to be a disciple. But let me say this as well in this context here. We've got to know our audience. And one thing that is interesting here is he mentions that they're going to go into all the nations. And that's different than the Jews. And so when we look at our, our audience today, the context of our world has changed. If you look at how society has changed, a lot of people, it used to be that if you talk to them about God, they knew you're talking about the God of the Bible. If you told them about sin, and baptism, and these kind of things, they kind of knew some of these, this vocabulary. But brethren, that's changing. Further and farther along the road, we're not going to be this Acts 2 culture where he can come in and say, you know the scriptures, you know who has been predicted, you know these various different things. We're now going to be in things like Acts chapter 17, where it's, I've got to tell you about this God that's different than all the other gods, and start laying that foundation. See, our time now is one that is full of questions where people are asking these foundational questions. Who is God? Who am I? Uh, what, are, what is the word of God? These are the kind of questions that are going to be out there. And do we have the answers? Do we know how to reasonably answer those with people to kind of walk through them? Those are things that we need to work on. But further, and I think this is important, not everybody has the exact same place. Not everybody has the exact same skill set. Even James says, let not many of you be teachers. Not everybody is supposed to fit into that. Everybody can contribute, though. So it's not just preaching from the pulpit. It may be things like having someone over to your dinner table. It may be spending time reading together, our personal classes. And in fact, if you ask people, how much do you get out of the sermons? I don't know. Maybe you get something out of the sermons. But usually when I talk to people, they remember going over to someone's house and the hours they spent with someone answering those questions and just, just walking through things. It's just different. Maybe, you know, the preaching is like the, the normal everyday meals, that if you didn't have them, well, you'd, there'd be a problem, right? But we can all find our place as inviters and welcomers and teachers. And in fact, isn't that what we've been talking about earlier this year? About those five simple things, Max did four, by the way. But invite, share, uh, share, let's see if I can even remember. Uh, share, invite, welcome, and what was the last one, Byron? Teach. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever it is, we didn't do a great job of that. But the whole process, though, is these are simple things, aren't they? They're simple things. And then we start there and we continue growing forward. 
But now let's talk about a couple of other things quickly before we end. We also need to teach disciples all that Jesus commanded. After that initial importance of someone obeying the gospel, they have to actually be discipled. When someone becomes a Christian, that's just the beginning. You have to shape them into the full image of Christ. And in fact, one man made this point. I thought it was very good, and I kind of summarized his thought. He said, if non-Christians are not hearing the gospel and not being challenged to make a decision for Christ, then the church has disobeyed one part of Jesus' commission. And if new converts are not faithfully and lovingly nurtured in the whole counsel of God's revelation, then the church has disobeyed the other. We've got to do both of them. That's what he was describing here. And it's important to understand this because, I don't know, maybe this is maybe you sympathize with this, maybe you don't. But a lot of times when we think about evangelism, we think about inviting people here. And yet the whole point is here, it's about going. <laughs> it's going out and, and realize the lost guys are not here. This is where the saved are. There may be some people that need to hear the gospel and be saved, but generally the lost are out there. And it's easy to think that the assembly is for non-Christians when, in fact, Paul brings up the point in 1 Corinthians 14, it's about Christians. And there may be a case where there is an unbeliever there, and you need to teach them, obviously. But for us to go and reach the lost, they're out there. They're in your jobs. They're in the marketplace. They're in all of these different places. And so when we look at the local church then, how do we then help disciples become what they're supposed to be and it's through the consistent teaching of Jesus word that's what we try to do that's why we work through texts like this it's why we're constantly in the scripture but also it's more than just teaching it's also the community I know sometimes to you know if you're struggling with something or you haven't been at services for a while and someone calls you or even confronts you on sin how many of us like that I don't like being confronted whenever I'm in wrong. Further, I don't like being the person that has to go and confront someone. I don't like that job either. But do you realize it's through the relationship, the accountability, and that correction and encouragement that that's actually how disciples are made? That's why Jesus spent a whole one of those discourses in chapter 18 about this community. It's more than just information. It's how we interact together. And so that means then... What is the fundamental purpose of this church? Is it entertainment? I sure hope not. I'm not that entertaining. <laughs> it's, it's not entertainment. It's not what makes us happy. It's not some social or political or societal agenda, even though we ultimately want joy and all of those things to come from it. It's about making disciples. It's about people that are hearing the word, knowing the word, and living the word. That's what it's all about. And so what does this look like? It looks like every single time you're going to open this book, if you're here. We're encouraging you to dig into this text. That's why we teach the way that we teach. That's why we also encourage people to participate in these small groups, these individual things as well, of trying to say, we want you to grow. We want you to be the disciples you're supposed to be. In short, turn to Ephesians 4 here. In Ephesians chapter 4, look at what he describes, and I'm just kind of laying this up. I can, I guess I'm setting up Byron for whenever he talks about this for our plan next year, Lord willing. But here in verses 11 through 16, look at what he says the church does for itself. It says in verse 11, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the tricker of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
What's he saying? It's leaders and every single person individually and collectively working together to shape and encourage and build one another up. That's the goal. That's how this is accomplished, and that's what we're trying to do here in this local church. But then let's end with this last one. Back here in Matthew 28, it's that we need the presence of Jesus. The disciples were going to face a difficult road, weren't they? As you look even in Matthew chapter 10, he talks about the rejection and suffering they would have. But the point is, Jesus is going to be with them and accomplish the work that he wants. In fact, in John 14, he said that they were going to do greater works than him. In John 15, when he talks about the fruit and the vine, he said it's because when you're in me, you will bear much fruit. And so he was going to work through them. But the truth is, in his present condition, was he able to go with the disciples everywhere? He wasn't able to until he ascended. When he ascended then, he was able to work through the power of the Spirit and personally go forward with them through the rest of time. In fact, you see that in the book of Acts. You know, Here's something for you to read. Look how many times Jesus appears in the book of Acts for the apostles. He's there. He's with them. But I'll tell you what this reminds me of. It reminds me of Joshua chapter 1. You remember when Moses was going to be taken away? And now we've got the newer and greater Moses being taken away. And they're concerned. I mean, what about all the battles that are before them? What about all the challenges that are going to be there? And yet, do you remember what God said? He said, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Those are the kind of things that he said, and it allowed them to have success then. But when you think about evangelism, does any of this sound easy? Making disciples is not for wimps. It's just not. (laughs) Whether you're talking about people in the world or even working in the local church. So how do we do it? It's through the presence of Christ. It's him working in us. And it's true all the way through the book of Acts. Jesus is constantly appearing, ordering, healing, guiding, all of those kinds of things. And while the same things happen today, they don't happen in the same way. Jesus works differently. It's not through miraculous things, but yet he's the one that comforts us when we're persecuted. He's the one that's our source of wisdom and teaching. And he's the one that opens our doors of opportunities as we share the gospel. It's these kind of things, understanding that he has all authority and that because of that and his presence is with us, it allows us to walk out without fear. But it's one of those most important things to remember. In fact, have you ever looked at this text and said that, and thought that this was a promise? There was one man, he was having a discussion with an older woman and he mentioned that this was kind of like a wonderful promise and the woman intelligently, piercingly, and thoughtfully said, that's not a promise, that's a fact. It's something that is already happening. With anybody that goes out, Jesus is there. and His authority and power are there. The point for us is we need to remember it and believe it. And that's what pushes us over the edge, to go and to be successful. Go to one last passage with me. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, he tells them the same kind of things about how they're going to suffer for the sake of righteousness. He says, if you do, he says not to fear their intimidation or be troubled. He's referring back to Isaiah. But he says these words here in verse 15, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who gives you, who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. See, what we need to have in our minds as we go forward is remember who's the king of the world. Seeing Jesus in his holiness on his throne and sanctifying him in our hearts. When that happens, we will give the answers that are needed. But one of the things that I think is important, when he says these words, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, is that Matthew has ended his gospel where he began. He began with God radically and amazingly coming into our world in the form of a man and being born of a woman and being that full and most comprehensive picture of a phrase, a word, Emmanuel. 
God with us. And do you remember when that was first given? It was given back in the time of Isaiah in the reign of Ahaz. And Ahaz was a king, someone that was supposed to be on God's side. In Syria and Israel, they had a plan. They were going to need to come down there and kill him and replace him as king. And he was shaking in his boots. He was scared. And the sign of Emmanuel was a promise saying, I'm going to ultimately bring my king into the world, and you have nothing to fear. It was the presence of God, and to save him and help him during his time of doubt. And so not only would that evil plot fail, which, guess what, spoiler alert, (laughs) they never got to do that. They never did. All those nations fell, and God was with them. But it was about something greater, too, because that evil plot failed, and the true plan of God would come about, and that king would come into the world and would succeed. And when Jesus comes into the world, that's what this message has been about. Everybody wanted him dead. Everybody fought against him the entire point, and yet the point is he still won and he had the victory. It is that message of Emmanuel, God with us. And it's an important point, as he says here with the Great Commission. The victory is already secured. The battle's already done. God has already had the victory, and he will ultimately defeat all enemies when Jesus returns. But our job is to go and to share the gospel, that good news, and make disciples of all the nations and to bring them into the image of Christ. And when he returns, we get to have the presence of Emmanuel currently, obviously, but to a perfect and complete and deeper degree forever whenever he returns. And so what we have this morning is we have the opportunity to remember that promise of Emmanuel, of him dying on the cross for our sins and of his presence being with us, and we get the opportunity to glorify him in the Lord's Supper. And so now we're going to have the opportunity to do that.